All right, I'm going to be talking about evolution and how uh, the scientific evidence have how the current up-to-date scientific evidence of how evolution is not real. Okay, um, I'm gonna have to stop the video. This video is gonna get pretty involved, but it's important to, to really see the evidence that we did not evolve from these monkeys. Okay. <laughs> Or from these primates, okay? Um, I'm gonna get into that really deeply in this video. If you don't like science stuff, I wouldn't watch this video, okay? You should watch it though, so you learn. But um, I'm trying to show you lots of evidence, lots of detailed evidence from Hugh Ross's, um, from Hugh Ross and some other sources of how we didn't. Evolution is not real. Evolution is not is it has been falling apart for a long time. Okay, the theory of evolution, it is, it has been, Darwin, Darwin was basing his, um, findings on future, he was basing his theory on future findings that never happened. Okay, and in fact, the findings that we have now are disproving evolution more, not, in, not proving it. Okay, alright, so I'm gonna get into that. So according to evolution, we were, we are supposed to be microbes that, the random changes to the protein molecule, molecules and the DNA. Random changes to DNA made us better. To these, it made humans. That's according to evolution. And these um, scientists are going to say that, that that's completely impossible. Alright, that's mathematically impossible. The chance of these the protein mole molecules randomly getting better is mathematically ridiculous. That's what these numbers are going to be about. Random changes to d decoding, to d d DNA code, doesn't make things better. So that's what these scientists are going to be saying. So before I get into the uh, bipedal primates, how that is completely impossible, I gotta start from the beginning on how it's scientific, it was impossible for us to evolve from microbes. Okay, I'm also going to get into how it's chemically, biologically, mathematically, physically impossible for anything to turn into something else from a different being to turn into a new being. Even on the cellular level, level it is impossible. Okay, I'm going to show you some evidence, some genetic inf evidence of this, some current science on, on this stuff, okay. So this, that's what um, these next two videos are going to be about. I'm going to try to break it down for you because it's kind of complicated. In other words, there's a single bacterium 3.8 billion years ago, and through strictly natural processes, that single bacterium evolved into producing us human beings. Now, a number of physicists have tackled this problem and say, okay, let's actually test this idea that we begin with a bacterium. And so just based on the probabilities of starting with uh, microbes, what's the probability of getting intelligent beings? And he basically calculated that probability was less than one chance in 10 to the one millionth power. I mean, there's only one chance in 10 to the one millionth power that we would come about as a result of this process. And to put that probability in some kind of context, uh, that's roughly equivalent to you winning the California lottery, um, eight million, pardon me, three million consecutive times where you buy one ticket each time. Now there's a couple of, there, there are many reasons that the neo-Darwinian mechanism, the idea of natural selection acting on random mutations does not explain the origin of that information. Let me run one by you, just, it's just a little bit intuitive. Um, if you, um, software programmers, engineers here, if you've got a section of software and it's functional, maybe it's a whole program, and you start changing the zeros and ones in that software randomly, question, are you more likely to degrade the information that's present there already or to generate a whole new software program or operating system? The laughter shows that everyone gets the point, right? When I was, it turned out though he was a really smart guy. He was an architect level programmer at Microsoft. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know he knew anything about what I did. And one day 
we're watching the girls play and he saunters over on the sidelines and leans over to me like this and he says, so what do these Darwinists think? The code just wrote itself? And then he paused for dramatic effect and said, not at Microsoft, it doesn't work that way. Okay, and so people who, okay. Now, in the 1960s, there were, uh, there were a group of mathematicians and engineers and, and, and computer scientists at MIT who found that at a, at, a, at a company picnic one day, at a university picnic with some of their biology colleagues in a conversation, they discovered that they were, as a group, really skeptical about the story the evolutionary biologists were telling about how random mutation and natural selection produced all this new genetic information. It's the mid-60s, people are just starting to appreciate the information-bearing properties of DNA and what it does inside living systems and how important it is to life. And these physics math guys are saying, I don't think this works. And one of them was Murray Eden, a famous guy now. He ended up convening a conference called Mathematical Challenges to Neo-Darwinism. And this is one of the things he said, expressing his skepticism. He says, no currently existing formal language system can tolerate random changes in the symbol sequences which express its sentences or meaning. Meaning is almost invariably destroyed. Oh, I made calculations on this as well. Um, and it turns out that um, that that if he lives a hundred years and does nothing but sample combinations, um, he's only going to sample about 3% of the total, okay? If we're looking at just one gene with the information for building one new protein, the ratio of the sequences that will produce a functional protein to all the gibberish sequences is about 1 over 10 to the 77th power. This has been experimentally determined for a very short pro a gene and protein sequence. Okay, now that's, there's only 10 to the 65th atoms in the entire galaxy, all right? So this is a big space to search, a big haystack looking for a one little needle, okay? Um, but it turns out that there's only 10 to the 40th organisms in the entire, this is, we're searching our 10 to the 77 possibilities. It turns out that three and a half billion years is not nearly enough time to search this effectively because there's only been 10 to the 40th organisms in the whole history of life on earth which means that if every organism in the entire history of life every time it replicated itself was generating a new sequence of dna you'd only still only search one ten trillion trillion trillionth of the possibilities okay one ten trillion trillion trillionth. yeah that's right which means that the neo-darwinian mechanism is not a plausible means of generating new genetic information and move on. And that's essentially what's happening in evolutionary biology today. Um, and I tell this story in the book. Um, the, the, there are many evolution, leading evolution, secular evolutionary biologists today who are now saying neo-Darwinism, the standard textbook theory of evolution, is it does, a, it does a good job of explaining small scale variation it doesn't do a good job of explaining the big changes in the history of life, the origin of new information, the origin of the new body plans that arise in events like the history of life. And so All right, I'm going to stop and paraphrase real fast. What he's saying is what these numbers mean is if, so according to evolution, the theory of evolution, um, random, random change in, changes in our genes and random changes in our chemicals and random changes in our cells made us better that's that's really crazy and that doesn't make sense just like if you were going to start messing around with computer code would if you randomly started putting different numbers in there randomly would it make the code better or worse it would be making it worse, right? The The chances of it getting better are so little, it's basically impossible. That's what these numbers mean, okay? Randomness does not create fine-tuning, all right? If you believe in evolution, you're saying that randomly fine-tuning happened, okay? If you mess with the fine-tuning, it makes it worse, not better. So natural selection is mathematically not really accurate okay it's, that's what all this is saying you start messing around with things that are fine fine-tuned randomly they're just gonna die and stuff they're not gonna get better 
It's like if I were to go go into my Toyota right now, if I randomly start just pulling out parts randomly because I'm not a mechanic, and throwing parts in randomly, is the Toyota gonna turn into a Mercedes? Probably not. <laughs> You're just gonna have a car that doesn't work. Okay, that's what all. That's how it's so ridiculous. Natural selection is ridiculous. Okay. The, like, seriously think about how ridiculous that is. When you mess around with things randomly, it makes it worse, not better. And in science, and hypotheses, do you go for the least likely explanation or the most likely explanation? The least likely explanation, mathematically, is that we change through randomness. Okay, that's almost impossible. We did not randomly start getting better. That's ridiculous. Natural selection is ridiculous. It's mathematically unsound. I'm going to get into the rest of it now, but it's not doesn't make sense. Okay? You're you're in math and science is supposed to go to with the hypothesis that's most likely true. What most likely is happening is something is designing this stuff to happen. So an outside intelligence, like God, is designing this stuff. Not that it randomly happened and it randomly made itself better. And we randomly changed our genes overnight to turn in from monkeys and microbes into something else. That's ridiculous. That's not... Think about how silly that is, okay? Alright. I'm gonna talk... I'm gonna get into it again. Also, do you think it's a good idea to bet your soul... On these odds right here, one to the trillionth power or whatever, do you want to bet your soul that, that maybe just one little molecule got better by randomness? The, does, that, does that sound like a good idea? Are these good odds that it happened or it didn't happen? Are you going to want to bet your soul on this one little baby, 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 baby chance that even one got better? That's a bad idea, right? Okay, think about okay, that. Okay, so now I'm gonna do some the DNA testing with humans and chimps. And I'm telling you, it's not 98%. It is because they're cheating and they're not counting all the DNA. Alright? It's we are not our DNA is not 99 or 98% close to chimps. It's they it's because these scientists, two scientists, did the DNA test on ourselves. They're not the only two, by the way. I'm just showing you some. And they said that it's not 98 or 99. It's because the original scientists are not counting all of the DNA. They're not counting it all. So, of course, it's, if they're not going to count it all, they're not counting the ones that make it less. They're counting the only one, the, the ones that make it more. They're not being fair. And according to their own, according to science, we're 92% mouse. Okay? No. Are, we, are you a mouse? Are you a, are you mantis being? Are you 44% fly? Alright, are you part fly? Which one are you? The thing is, there is genetic similarities because God uses the same genetic code to make certain parts of your body. Alright? He used... A, if you know anything about making genetic... Of coding, computer coding, that's what you do when you make something new. You borrow from that old genetic code to make something new you don't it doesn't mean you, you are a fly and you are a mouse or you are a monkey it means you just have same similar code because a good coder uses old code to make new code not that that it's the same thing they're different things all right so watch this um the, the question, question really comes, comes down, down to the dna, DNA. and one, one of the things, things that's really interesting is we have sequenced DNA, DNA for both humans and chimps. Okay, so, so we have that information, we can compare them. And uh, so, so what do we find out when we compare the DNA? DNA? And, and Dr. Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins, who's a geneticist at the Institute for Creation, Creation Research, has done a lot of study on this. He's, he's not, not only looked at what the evolutionists have done and what, how are they doing this, but he's done a lot of his own original research. And, and one, one of the things he found when he looked at what the evolutionists have done is that they have a lot of preferential and selective treatment of the data. Data is data. Depending, depending on, on how, how you, what you present and how you present it, you can make it say what you want it to say. Yeah, and what, what you don't talk about, about right? What, what you leave right. out. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and so, so one of the things is they, um, a lot of times when they do these comparisons of the DNA, they just use sequences they expect 
to, to be, be similar. similar. Okay. okay. So, so for, for example, example, they just use the genes. Um, the, the genes, genes are what give rise to the proteins. Now, now I would expect the genes to be pretty similar because from a from a biological perspective, chimps are mammals, so are we. Okay. So our DNA should actually be. Um, on, on that, that level, level should be pretty similar. similar. Our bodies have to do similar things. Mm. So it's not a good place to look for the differences, okay, if we're trying to evaluate what's different. Because obviously we're very different from each other, so what makes us different? And even when they do count all of the DNA, let's say they look at everything, all the bases, there's certain differences they don't count. So they don't count what's called non-aligned DNA, gaps, copy number variations, and size differences. Now, you don't, you don't need, need to know, know what all of these things, things are. are. <laughs> That's <laughs> going to take more time than we have. <laughs> but um, all those things are legitimate differences between human and chimp DNA, but they're not counted. Now I'm going to get into the fossil evidence. What does the fossil evidence say? There is absolutely no evidence of evolution in fossils. Since they're like these are the very beginning of time, plants and animals. There is no sign of evolution. And this is the evidence, and what the evidence actually says, okay? Alright, and then I'm going to get into the primates. So, anyway, uh, so the, the book Darwin's Doubt tells the story, and it tells the story of a doubt that Darwin had about his own theory, and how that doubt has grown up to create a major crisis in evolutionary biology today. That's what the book is about. And I start the book with a line, and I'm going to quote myself. It's a little bit self-aggrandizing, but forgive me. When Charles Darwin finished his great masterpiece, The Origin of Species, he thought he had explained every clue but one. It's an event in the history of life known as the Cambrian Explosion. And the Cambrian Explosion refers to the geologically sudden appearance of most of the major animal groups or body plans and many of the major body plans the, uh, that have ever existed on earth emerged very suddenly and abruptly in the fossil record in the same period known as the cambrian period and darwin was aware of this in 1859 and it troubled him because it didn't the pattern of appearance didn't really match what he had described in his book or he that the first animals arose very abruptly with no discernible ancestors in the lower strata that would allow the scientists to connect the dots and form a tree-like picture of the history of life an interesting system my computer isn't hooked up to what's actually going on back there so sorry about this um here's a nice picture by the way that depicts the the the, the challenge of the cambrian explosion you see all these different animal forms behind me on one side you see the sedimentary rock column, and on the other side you see the standard uh, geological dating scheme in millions of years. And you see that at a particular point in the history of life, boom, you have these new, fo these new forms of animal life that arise very suddenly. And as I mentioned, this contradicts the Darwinian picture of the history of life. This is that the geologists and paleontologists and evolutionary biologists attempted, or is rather expected to see in the lower strata. What he's saying is, that the the fossil records show just a sudden appearance of animals okay a sudden appearance of living creatures they didn't for slowly form from little microbes into into creatures do you know what supports the sudden appearance of creatures the bible just like the big bang is just saying the big universe had a beginning the Cambridge, Cambridge explosion is just saying the animals had a sudden beginning. Big Bang just means a sudden beginning of the universe. Like the Bible says, the Cambrian explosion just says there was a sudden appearance of animals. Just like the Bible says. Okay? The fossils show that all of a sudden there are animals in a short period of time. They didn't come from anywhere. They were just there. Okay? Just like the universe had a beginning, these animals had a sudden beginning. Just like the Bible says. That's what the fossils prove. The fossils do not prove evolution. That's what he's saying. Okay? So this is the data, what the data shows, and this is the theory. The theory is false. The blue stuff, the blue dots never happened. All those missing links, they're all missing. Okay? They're all missing. The data and the theory are completely contradicting each other. Okay, the fossils show the opposite. So, I think it's creepy that this lying tree... So, the tree of life is not real. 
Okay, the tree of the evolutionary tree of life is a lie. All right, and I think it's creepy because the devil he likes to he lies and he pretends he's God. Right? He says this is my tree of life. God said this is my tree of life. Which tree are you gonna bite from? Okay, which one are you gonna take? Which one are you gonna believe? Are you gonna believe in the Bible? Or are you going to believe in this, this this lying fruit right here? Okay? It's not a coincidence. It's called Tree of Life. It's all the devil. The devil's lie. He's a liar. He says that he's God, right? He mimics God. But he's not God. He's a liar. Okay? I, this is not. It's not a coincidence that this lying, this lying the theory is called the Tree of Life. Right? It's not. A, it's not a coincidence. The devil is. The devil is behind all this. These lies, you guys. Please don't believe it. All right. All right. Before I get into this next fossil, I need to tell you that um, the the Bible does talk about dinosaurs. Okay. Um. It, it's in the Book of Job. They're called behemoths. It. It's describing a dinosaur. God made dinosaurs, and it even describes how. The dinosaurs became extinct. It says his sword fell upon his sword, his sword fell upon him. It even tells you that they went extinct. So dinosaurs are in the Bible. I'm just gonna throw that in there right before I do this next one. They're in the Bible. They're in the book of Job, okay? Now I'm sure some of you ha have in your 90s science books or maybe you've just heard about it. About all these bird type dinosaurs missing link type things okay this is 100 proven to be a hoax not just from christian scientists or whatever you're thinking all scientists knows that all scientists know that this is a hoax now okay they found out these fossils were not real from these bird dinosaur things pterodactyls did not grow wings or the other way around i mean did not grow feathers okay or the other way around dinosaurs did not have feathers Okay, this is 100 proven to be a f hoax. Okay, there is absolutely no evidence of dinosaurs and birds linking up together. Zero. Okay, their dinosaurs did not turn into birds. Okay, it's 100 pr proven to be a, a fake, fake fossils. Okay, all right. All right, I'm gonna get into the uh, the the meat of the video. The evidence of the evolution of the primates into humans, or the lack thereof. Okay, all right. So it's gonna get kind of involved again, but again, I'm gonna at the end I'm gonna explain to you what these scientists were saying. Okay, in layman's terms. Okay, all right. So, but uh, this has been kind of a breakthrough discovery on Homo erectus, and uh, it's all based on a new dating technique. You know, sometimes it's not so much the bones that you find, it's your capacity to date them. And this is really where our greatest uncertainty lies uh, in the uh, 10 or 11 species of bipedal primates that precede human beings, is that we really don't have very good dating techniques. And uh, they're using, you know, things like uh, various optical luminescence techniques, which can be off by a factor of 10. Well, what this uh, paper in Nature is all about is a, a technique of using aluminum 26 and beryllium 10. Could they make fire? Uh, there is evidence, some evidence, that Neanderthal may have uh, exploited fire opportunistically. In other words, if some lightning bolt came down and set some trees on fire, uh, they may have used that to keep warm. Uh, there was some speculation that they were roasting their food, uh, but that really is highly disputed. Uh, we don't really have any undisputed evidence that that was the case. How about Erectus? Uh, Erectus, uh, we have uh, no evidence at all. Uh, there, it may have been the case. I mean, we're now recognizing that uh, you know Homo erectus was about five feet tall, so it was about a, you know eight inches shorter than we are on the average. <laughs> Uh, the cranial capacity was a lot less than it was for Neanderthal. On the other hand, there's evidence that Neanderthal used a lot of its brain mass to have sharp senses so that it could uh, hunt uh, creatures more effectively than Homo erectus could. So 
Uh, but the interesting thing about Homo erectus is that uh, Homo erectus was here from 2.0 million years ago, and there's even some evidence that it may have persisted until 50,000 years ago in the Indonesian islands. I don't dispute that uh, Homo erectus survived until at least 200,000 years ago in Indonesia, and some evidence suggesting maybe even as late as 50,000 years ago. Uh, but what is really significant in an argument against the evolutionary paradigm, if you look at the bones that are, uh, that are consistent with the 2.0 million year date and compare them with the most recent, we see no change in the bone structure. We have, that still won't help you. What you need to do is compare recent DNA to ancient DNA for a species. We can do that for Neanderthal, by the way. In over a 100,000 year period, we don't see any measurable change in the DNA, neither do we see any measurable change in the skeletal structure. And the case of Homo erectus, again, where we've got dozens of complete skeletons, we see no change in the skeletal structure. So what we have is stronger evidence, thanks to these discoveries, that uh, this is a species that did not evolve with respect to time. And if Homo erectus doesn't evolve, and if uh, Neanderthal doesn't evolve, and by the way, we can draw the same conclusion for human beings. We now have DNA that goes back 40,000 years, well, about 35 to 40,000 years, and that DNA is not distinguishable from modern human DNA. So those are three species for which we can't see any measurable evolution, and if that is the case, then Charles Darwin's descent of man hypothesis certainly must be wrong. Yeah. Okay, what is a Neanderthal? creationists see Neanderthal as simply a bipedal primate akin to, say, um, orangutans or chimpanzees. Uh, we do not believe that they had a spirit. Um, we do believe that they were capable of using tools, but the interesting thing about Neanderthal is the evidence we have for tool use is barely that above what a chimpanzee is capable of doing. Um, and I think what, this, what got things a bit confused is Neanderthals overlap human beings by about 10,000 years. And Neanderthals, like chimpanzees, steal human tools and use them. And so people presume that these Neanderthals are much more advanced in their tool capability than they really were. Uh, but if you look at what the Neanderthals were doing before human beings showed up, or in those regions where human beings had not yet uh, settled, uh, their tool use is well, the most advanced you ever get is a Neanderthal taking a boulder and smashing that rock against another rock, getting a bunch of flakes, and using the flakes to scrape the flesh off bones. That's the most advanced tool use you see. Whereas when human beings show up on the scene, you immediately see sophisticated tools, shovels and axes and hammers. Uh, you see needles for sewing uh, cloth together. Uh, pardon me? And jewelry, yeah. Neanderthals had no clothing, no jewelry. Okay, now this, there's also no evidence that Neanderthals ever built any housing. Uh, we do see evidence that they took advantage of caves. Well, there's been a revolution in this in the last 10 years. I mean, what you're describing is a story that scientists had of Neanderthal a decade ago, which was that Neanderthals uh, were like us, and it's true, they were tall. Uh, they were completely bipedal. They could walk as easily as we could walk, um, almost as easily. And, uh, you know, they had brains the same size as ours. Um, our brain is no bigger than a Neanderthal brain. Um, and they were well adapted for cold weather. And the presumption was that Neanderthals simply intermarried and interbred with modern humans, and that many of us in this room today uh, have Neanderthal of blood within them. Uh, some of you wives might think your husbands have Neanderthal characteristics, but uh, uh, that's all been completely overthrown. And the reason, the primary reason that has now been uh, tossed away uh, is because of DNA evidence. Uh, the DNA evidence tells us definitively both Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA uh, that there is no biological link whatsoever between humans and Neanderthals and that Neanderthals went extinct rapidly shortly after the appearance of uh, human beings. And we now know they did not wear clothes, they did not build houses. There is some evidence 
of uh, carbon char near Neanderthal sites. And the presumption there again was that they must have been able to domesticate fire in the same way that early humans did. But the scientific literature is now has a consensus opinion that this was simply chance. At best, the Neanderthals were taking advantage of wildfires. Uh, we don't even have any evidence that they ever cooked their food. I'm just simply saying that uh, the evidence that they had religious services, wore clothes, uh, had advanced tools, and uh, you know built homes, uh, that's all gone by the way based on the latest research. And theist anthropologists of 10 years ago today still interpret Neanderthals as fully human, and not just Neanderthals. I was surprised that they interpret Homo erectus as fully human. Now, Homo erectus, morphologically, is really different from uh, human beings. But they claim that in this room today, there would be descendants of the Homo erecti, uh, as well as descendants of Neanderthals, and that we all interbred. But the DNA evidence is definitive that that, that couldn't have happened. The, the um, so he was saying the new evidence shows that Homo erectus and Homo, uh, Homo erectus and Neanderthals they, you can go get the old bones and go get the current bones and test them and look, they did not evolve at all, okay? The Neanderthals and stuff, they were here for two million years and they did not evolve at all, okay? And they were not wearing clothes like this. I did, I just, I did this picture on purpose because everyone thinks that this is what they look like. They're not even what they look like, okay? They look like monkeys and we just put... A human form on them and our art when you try to reconstruct them and that's a lie and then I'm gonna talk about that in the next video in the next slide real fast but um they were not making fire they were not rubbing two sticks together and making fire okay sometimes if there was a natural fire happening they would throw nuts in there to bust open the nuts that was as far as they got the Neanderthals and the Homo erectus they were just as smart as the monkeys that we have now they were they were just standing upright that's it and the Neanderthals, they were not making their own tools, okay? Sometimes they would carry a stick in their hand, but they were not making arrowheads and stuff like that. That has all been disproven. The, what, sometimes what would happen is because there was an overlap with real human beings and Neanderthals, sometimes the Neanderthals would steal the human weapons. Just like monkeys do now. Monkeys steal cameras and stuff all the time. They steal drinks. They steal all kinds of stuff. Okay, they're just like the monkeys now. It would be like if someone from a million years from now went and saw this picture and said, Oh man, look at those monkeys. We're making those machine guns. They're so smart. They <laughs> were. It's the same thing with the tools they had back then. They stole it from the humans. Okay, the human, because they over, the Neanderthals and the humans overlapped each other. Okay? Okay? Just like monkeys steal stuff now. Okay. All right, we're trying to gather all the evidence together. All right, you're gonna if you go on YouTube, you're gonna find if you read stuff on older stuff on evolution, you're gonna hear lots of stories about how these Neanderthals and all these apes were doing funeral rites. They were burying their dead and they're doing all these funeral. That has completely been disproven. All right, these people are not even Christian scientists. They're saying that it was falsified. They were not burying their dead. They were not having religious ceremonies. They were not having any kind of religious ceremonies. It's all been disproven. What was happening was when they find monkey bones and 60 feet across from them, they'd find plants. And they're trying to call, say that that was a funeral. And that they admit that that, that, that is idiotic. Okay. Those plants could have been there from 10,000 years before. Those things probably didn't even die together. Just because you find a if you find a skeleton and six not even on top of the skeleton they find did they find flowers. It was necked like sixty feet across the yard, the field, they find flowers. 
that was around the same time, maybe, and they're ca- they were calling that a funeral. Give me a break. Okay, most scientists admit that that is not true. And also, Lucy, Lucy, Lucy is a fake. In case you didn't know that, this big, you know, a while back they discovered Lucy. Oh, evolution's real. It's proven to be fake. She was just a little monkey. She was not even a Neanderthal. She was like a foot, two feet tall. Not even over three feet tall. She was just a bones of a monkey. Completely debunked. Also, you're going to hear lots of evidence that these things were making musical instruments. Okay? They have this one evidence. This one thing that's saying that that this is a flute. It's been debunked by most scientists. Even the National Geographic may have an article saying this is not a flute. This is teeth marks from an animal that bit into the bone. Okay, so if you ever see evidence, so-called evidence that they were making musical instruments, this is the only thing they have. And it's been debunked by most articles and scientists. This is the funniest one, I think. You're going to hear lots of stories about that these Neanderthals made rope. Okay, this is the only evidence that they have of them making rope. Does this even look like rope? It's just a, it's just a bundle of tree bark, and they're try- and it's not even an inch long, and they're trying to say that they these big Neanderthals were making rope. Okay, this is really look at this thing. This is just rolled up tree tree bark. Neanderthals were not making rope. Even birds can weave sticks and bark together to to make nests. They don't they don't come out and calculate it. They just know how to do it. Okay, even if they are maybe tying some things together, that doesn't mean that they were human beings. All right, and this is, but they don't even have any other evidence that they're making rope. They have this one thing that doesn't even look like rope. Birds do a better job than whatever this is. Okay, and they did not look like this. Neanderthals and Homo erectus, they didn't look all human like this. This is a lie. Okay, they they because back in the back in the original days they thought these things came from human, so they started making these molds that made them look more human. The monkey, the bones do not resemble that they look like humans at all. They look like cre- creepy monkeys. Okay, I'll get into that right now. But they were not making fire. They were not even wearing clothes. Okay, another thing is they were not making um, they were not having little religious services. They're saying well. Well, they were having religious services because they found pollen next to uh, a great uh, dead body. That does not mean they had a funeral. This means someone died next to pollen, okay? And even if just because they were having reli- a m- m- mourning their dead doesn't mean that they were human either. Elephants mourn their dead. Cats and animals mourn their dead. That doesn't mean they're human, all right? Um, they were not making any art. They were not making any art at all. They were not painting. They did not make jewelry. They were not making clothes. They are walking around for two million years butt naked, and they did not learn a whole lot. Okay, they did. They were exactly the same. They did not evolve. Okay, they were just hunting, and they were not doing any art or anything like that. That all. That's all stuff. That's all human stuff. Okay, they did not did not have tattoos and all the stupid stuff you see at the museums. They know that now. Okay, they weren't doing all that stuff. I'm going to get into this next slide of this, this other science. This scientist is not even a Christian scientist, but he, believe, he believes that the Neanderthals didn't look like this. He believes that the Neanderthals didn't look like this. Okay, and he has evidence of that. Uh, my, Dr. Ross does too, but if I just do Dr. Ross, you're like, well, he's just one scientist that says it. No, all scientists, more, a lot of scientists say this stuff, okay? I'm going to show you this guy. This guy's evidence on how it's ridiculous that these Neanderthals did not look like that. Okay. This is the current accepted view of what Neanderthals look like. A bit hairier than us, and with a larger nose and thicker brow. There's a couple of things wrong with this picture. First, it's not based on any sound archaeological evidence. That's because soft tissue features like skin, hair, colour and eyeballs are not preserved in the fossil record. The other reason is that after studying Neanderthals for 10 years, I'm convinced they look nothing like this at all. In this video, I'm going to draw on the latest archaeological, genetic and forensic evidence to challenge all your assumptions about what Neanderthals look like. There's a reason why all these forensic reconstructions end up looking like humans 
and it's got nothing to do with science. The pomorphic problem, there's also a fundamental flaw in the technique used to reconstruct Neanderthal faces from their skulls. Now this forensic process works fine on humans, but that's because we know the shape and position of our noses, ears and lips, we know the thickness and texture of our skin, and we know the shape and size of our eyeballs. These soft tissue features are unique to humans. You would never use them to reconstruct the face of a chimpanzee or gorilla. And yet, scientists always use human facial characteristics and dimensions to reconstruct Neanderthal faces. So it's inevitable that you end up with something that looks like a human. It's spurious science, but it's not. And one reason is that Neanderthal eyes were in a different position in their skulls compared to humans. They were higher up, about where our foreheads are. And judging by the size of their orbits, or eye sockets, their eyes were also considerably larger as well. Which raises an interesting question. What did they look like? Actually, once you get rid of all the anthropomorphic look like humans, ultimately, Neanderthals were members of the order of primates. They were primates. And as such, you would expect them to maintain the appearance of primates. For example, when I compared the profile of a Neanderthal with a chimpanzee, they seemed to fit amazingly well. For my book, Them and Us, I commissioned one of the world's best digital sculptors to create a completely new forensic reconstruction based on my theories. We began by scanning the skull of a French Neanderthal. Then, over several months and hundreds of emails and phone calls between Spain and Australia, a creature gradually emerged. Okay. He, he goes on, I'm going to paraphrase, I'm going to paraphrase the rest of it real fast. Um, um, he goes on to say that these things were probably still had hair all over. He just did, they just did the basic, the one without hair so you can see its frame. Okay. But they had hair. These things were living in the ice age. They did not lose their hair. <laughs> okay. They were still hairy all over. Uh, like the depiction slowly, they start losing their hair and looking like humans. The, 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 these are the Neanderthals, the ones right before the humans. No, they were not. They still were hairy. They were living in the Ice Age, okay? Um, also, he goes on to say that their eyes, based on the eye sockets and how big their eye sockets were on the skull, these things were night hunters. These things were hunting at night, okay? That's why their eye sockets were like that, and that's why their eyes were so big. They could see in the dark. Does that, do you have any idea how how complicated our human eye is? You think our eyes went from a nocturnal creature's eyes to a human eye just in the very in the same blink of an eye? Uh, uh it's so impossible. That didn't happen. Okay, you want to keep believing it? Go ahead, but I'm telling you, it's a lie. All right, this guy is not even a Christian scientist. He still says evolution is possible, but he says that they didn't look like this. I'm like, no, bro, but. I was, I'm just trying to tell you, a bunch of scientists are disproving all the stuff, okay? And some of them are not, some of them are just atheists too, okay? So don't just say, oh, these are just a bunch of crazy Christian scientists. No, that guy's not even Christian, okay? All right. And also, they started proving that these things were cannibals. They were eating each other. When things got tough, they started eating their young. They started eating each other. You want to be evolved from this thing? Does that sound like something... Like you want to be coming from, they are they are cannibals, and they are night vision hunters. They have nothing to do with the modern humans. When I first started realizing that these um, Neanderthals didn't even look like that, they were just putting on human forms to them. It reminded me of the scripture. I don't think it's a coincidence either. Um, obviously, the scripture this. This, this warning is for many things, but this is definitely one of them that popped out. Beware of a wolf in sheep's clothing. Okay? That's what the, that's a scripture that came out to me right away when I realized that they're putting fake human skins over the monkey bones. Okay? And making it seem like it's something that it's not. Um, so wicked. So wicked. Um, please don't believe in this stuff, you guys.
Also, it reminds me of like skinwalkers. I'm not trying to say that these Neanderthals are skinwalkers, but it's, it's the same theology. Skinwalkers are demons who wear a lying skin, right, on their bodies. They say that they're something they're not. This is just a symbolically a lying skin uh, evil, right? All right, I, th I, I wanted to make that connection. I, that came out right away. Uh, and here's what Darwin said about it. He said, to the question why we do not find rich fossiliferous deposits belonging to these assumed earliest periods, prior to the Cambrian system, the Cambrian uh, strata, I can give no satisfactory answer. This is right in the origin of species. Now, it's really interesting. I really appreciate Darwin because uh, unlike many of his modern defenders, he was, um, he was rhetorically honest. He was rhetorically modest. He didn't try to say he'd solved all the problems when he hadn't. He didn't pound his fist and say anyone who disagreed with him was, was uh, stupid or uh, ignorant or insane. Um, but some of his modern proponents do say things like that. Uh, a few years ago, I had the chance to testify before the Texas State Board of Education. And uh, they were a uh, uh, common sense provision. And their argument was, uh, and I quote, there are no weaknesses in the theory of evolution. Let me get it up there. There we go. And um, this is Eugenie Scott, who was then the, the uh, president of the National Center for Science Education, a small Darwin-only science lobbying group out of Oakland, California. And when I saw this, I, I thought this was, a, a, you know, a, a, an incredibly unfortunate statement. I was about to pre present into evidence 100 peer-reviewed, a binder of 100 peer-reviewed scientific arg articles questioning various aspects of contemporary evolutionary theory, what's known as neo-Darwinism, the standard textbook theory that we all learn in, the, in our high school and college biology texts. So at the very least, there are scientific problems with the theory, scientific weaknesses of the theory that need to be explored. Darwin was aware of some in his time and talked about them openly, but unfortunately, in our modern discussion of, of biological origins, too many people defending the orthodox view think that it's, uh, they, they can't acknowledge the actual state of the science that is, is in play. Darwin himself said he could be wrong about some things and he didn't know about a lot of things, but even Darwin himself said that in his book. But, pe but people still insist that it's just 100% real and they don't want to talk about it and they won't look at the evidence. Their eyes are shut and their ears are shut. They don't want to listen to it or even be open to it. It's ridiculous. So sometimes scientists go to school boards and they go to, you know, like these, these big conventions or these big meetings to decide what goes into education. Okay. Scientists go up to the school boards all the time, pr 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 giving them all this, all this evidence that evolution's not real. There are at least, you, he said at least show the kids that there's pros and cons of evolution. Don't just teach them evolution. At least like show up, teach them the cons of it too. Cause there's a lot of cons. Okay. A lot. There's not even in any much, very much proof that there is, that it did happen, but oh well. Right. So, and most of my education board, well, we're used to just having it in the textbooks and it's going to be too expensive to add a whole new chapter about how it's not real. So do you know what they do now? Is that sometimes your textbooks will have a sticker when it, when it talks about evolution. They'll put a little sticker on there saying, just so you know, this may or may not be true. <laughs> like the kids are really going to go look up the cons like they care, right? But that's the problem. Okay. Uh, they're not teaching this stuff in school because they're just, they, they, they just stay all, oh, they just want to stick with evolution. It's a tradition, right? It's a dangerous t tradition that everyone kept following, that everyone keeps going with. The, this is why in the Bible it says, it warns you about falling into tra tra traditions, not just religious traditions, false uh, teachings like this traditions, Okay. The evidence for evolution is basically zero, but it's still going to be in your kids' textbooks. And I love this. I love how all these new Darwinists or pro-Darwinists forget that Darwin was a full-blown racist. If you believe in evolution, I am calling you a racist. I am God is calling you a racist. You are unbelievably racist. 
All right. Darwin, according to his findings, well, people will argue, well, why don't we see evolution today? And then he's going to bring up the race card. And the new scientists will glance over that because they don't want to get in trouble, but they still believe it. Okay? They'll brush over that area. They'll change the subject real fast because they know that's not politically correct. But because they actually believe that these people of color are less than human than people, white people. You are racist. I am not kidding you. No joke. Darwin combined with Nietzsche started the Nazi party. Do you see what happens when you make up lies and sin? It snowballs into worse things. It domino effects into more evil. The Nazi party started from Darwin and Nietzsche philosophy, which was a, you can rule yourself to make yourself better. All right. The Nazi party was all about Darwin. Okay. They're all about evolution and making a clean race. Darwin started all that. Do you see how one evil idea turns into more evil? So you remember that before you start going up here saying evolution is real. All right. Really think about it. I, I want you to know what's going to happen to you if you are saying evolution is real. You are contributing to this lie. All right. It's not a joke. Evolution is not real. God made you. You're not a monkey. There's no evidence that you're a monkey. It's all been diluted with people's own understanding of things. Because they don't want to believe in the Bible. So Darwin made up his own stuff. That's not even true. The devil's lies always domino effect into worse evil. And it's just going to keep going. Yes, you can tell someone's race from their bones. That is called adaptation. When a people group stay in one area for a long period of time, they ad adapt to their surroundings. Adaptation is not evolution. You are not turning into something else. You are adapting to your surroundings. It is not turning from less human to more human. You are out of your mind if you believe that. Alright. You're out of your mind and you're evil if you believe that a race is less human than another race. And that is the theory of evolution. You know, the devil really needs you to believe in this. I know this stuff seems old even. Like, oh well. No, he needs you to keep believing in this. So you will believe in this. His lies are always have a domino effect for future generations, okay? He never just stops with one lie. He's playing the long game. The devil's playing the long game, you guys. Do not believe in evolution. If you believe in evolution, then you're going to believe in this crap, right? Okay? This is also demonic, okay? Artificial intelligence, you transcending your body into the atmosphere, you thinking you're evolving into an alien, that stuff is um, demonic. De uh, aliens are demons, okay? So you will go, you will evolve into a demon, okay? You will evolve, you will go right to hell, <laughs> and you'll be, you'll be this animal that can see in the dark, all right? I don't think any of that stuff is coincidence. In hell, you can see in the dark, just like that ape. Coincidence? No. God's like, you want to believe, you want to believe that you're an animal? You will become one of these animals forever, all right? And it's not going to be fun. All right. Another reason why the devil wants you to think that evolution is real is because he wants you to think that you came from an animal, not from God. Do you have any idea how many people believe, turned away from the Bible because of evolution? It was one of his greatest tricks, and it's going to keep going, too. But the devil wants you to think that you're an animal because these animals didn't have any souls, okay? Those, these apes don't have souls the same way we do, all right? We are in the image of God. That's why we made tools. We, are, we, we learned attributes from God, like creating, okay? That's why, we make, that's why we make music. That's why we make art. Animals don't do that stuff because they are not made in the image of God. We are. This devil wants you to think that you're just a stupid ape, okay? You're just a silly ape, and then you're not responsible for your your um, cravings, right? You're just responding to your animal nature. Uh-uh. You want to be a carnivorous, demon-looking monkey? You will be. If you, the gods like you want to follow that route, go ahead. When you die, you will be with all the demon 
demon cannibalistic ape monkeys, okay? That way, you will be with the, those things, okay? In hell. There are everyone down in hell that are eating each other. Okay, it's disgusting. And they can see in the dark just like that monkey. I don't think it's a coincidence, okay? I think God has a message for you with this, okay? A big message. A warning. Just think about this. I used to believe in evolution. I was an atheist. I had learned the hard way that thing, it's all trick, okay? 